Welcome to the Rap Race to Five podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place. Here to challenge you to think out of the box, your hosts, Felipe Mejia and Diego Corzo. Diego, what's up, man? So I'm super excited today for Rat Race to Fi. I'm excited because we have Ali and Josh. They've grown their social media by tens, literally tens of thousands from 10 to 20 to 30 in the past like three months, which is incredible. And they tell us how they did that. Additionally, they're going to talk about how they're growing their real estate portfolio same way by leaps and bounds. I'm super excited to dig in. Yeah, and I'm very excited too because they share their story, which is super relatable how they're investing as a couple, but also how they started with, with house hacking buying their first property, house hacking it, a second house hack, and now how they want to sort of like evolve and not do house hacking anymore. But it's an interesting perspective to see that of, of what's to come in the future for them. I agree. I'm super excited because one of the other things that I really liked about this podcast is that they go into detail. They're relatable and they tell us exactly how they're doing the things they're doing, how they communicate as a couple to invest in real estate long-term, their goals, visions, and what's next. No more banter, though. Let's just bring him right in. Ali, Josh. Let's go. Ali, Josh, thank you so much for being on the Rat Race to Five podcast. I'm super excited to have you guys here. As always, I'm here with uh, my host as well, Diego. What's up, dude? How are you? What's up? What's up? Doing very well. Today, I'm in Austin, Texas. I love it. Right? Because you're always traveling. Like, I never know where you're at. Luckily, you've done all your podcasts from home, though. So that works for me. Yes. But you do travel a lot. Ali, Josh, what's up? How are you guys doing today? We're doing great. We are super excited to be on here and to chat with you guys. Yeah, it's a huge honor, guys. Thank you. <laughs> no, absolutely. Before the before the recording started, actually, uh, Josh was telling us how cool we are, Diego. I wish you could rewind that and do it again. That made me my head feel this much bigger. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've been listening to you guys across different podcasts for, for years now and learning from the both of you, you know, from afar um, and then implementing a lot of the strategies you guys have talked about in your own journeys in our own. Awesome. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. We appreciate that. We, we genuinely, uh, Diego and I have a heart and passion, um, for helping and serving others, uh, how to reach FI to get out of the rat race and, and just have a, a, a better life lifestyle. Um, but we're not here to talk about us. We're here to talk about you guys, Ali, Josh, I want to get to know you guys a little bit better. Is it cool if we start with how you guys met and then we can kind of go from there into real estate? Yeah. Absolutely. You go you ahead. You want to share? No, you go ahead. Me? Okay. Um, Josh and I met in college. We went to state school in New York, and we both transferred into the same major at the same time. His uh, senior year, and, or no, your junior year and my sophomore year. Yep. And um, he was one of three men in the major, so he kind of stood out. Um, and we were friends for a long time. He knew time. exactly what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, look at the smirk on his face. <laughs> one, three out of the one. Oh, man. He knew exactly. My man. I give you a high five. Eh. Yeah, like female ahead, dominated. Ali. Yeah, female <laughs> dominated major, right? So um, we were friends for a really long time. And he was in a relationship. I was in a relationship. Um, but eventually the timelines kind of like synced up and we started dating. Um, and then, yeah, it was kind of history from there. We've, he was always my best friend as soon as we met though. Yeah, and, we, uh, we, we started long distance and then eventually um, Allie moved into the city that I live in. Um, she pursued her master's degree uh, got that, um, graduated in 2017, um, and we were off to the races after that. I love that. That's awesome. So you guys, okay, so you guys met in college. Let's, let's let the crowd, or, let, or let's whoever's listening, let's let them know who you guys were in high school. This is actually one of my favorite stories. Allie, give us 30, 45 seconds who you were in high school. Josh, same thing. Who are you guys in high school? Let's, get, let's let people know who you are. So like in this relationship, you have a type A person that marries a type B person, right? So I was like that high strung type A um, drama and chorus nerd that was in all of like the honors and AP classes. Um, and Josh was like quite about the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So I grew up incredibly poor, um, you know, in and out of mobile home parks um, without a whole lot of money. 
And so fortunately, I, from a very early age, found competitive sports. And so I had a lot of mentors who kind of took me under their wing um, and kept me from getting too involved with some of the rough crowds I grew up in. Um, so I did sports all of my life. And then if I wasn't doing sports, I was working two or three jobs so that I had enough money to get a car so that I could then work more. Um, and that was pretty much kind of my story in high school. Oh, man, I can definitely resonate with that. Uh, I grew up in a mobile home through high school uh, and, and, and some into college, but I was able to use my mobile home to now, you know, trajectory me into what I, uh, you know, the little that I have now. So I think, I, I think my family and God for that. Um, but I can already tell that you guys make a great team because of, you know, your personalities and who you guys are. So a lot of people on social media know that Diego and I make a great business partnership because he's very much into implementing and I'm very much vision. So we work really well together. And it sounds like, I don't know yet, but it sounds like that's the route that you guys are going. So I'm excited to dig into that uh, and to see who, who, who does what, who plays what roles uh, as we move more into the story of real estate. So um, after, after college and everything, um, how did you guys get started in investing in real estate? What, yeah. what caught that bug for you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, between two bachelor's degrees and a master's, we had a, about 102,000 in student loans. And um, that was a really big motivator for us because we didn't want to have $102,000 in student loans. And so uh, we moved in together. Um, we were finally both working full time. And it was right about that time I started getting really interested in things like personal finance. Um, I started reading Dave Ramsey and stuff like that. And um, that kind of led me down the rabbit hole of, you know, things like bigger pockets and stuff. And I saw the power of real estate and the idea of you could own a home and someone else would pay it for you. And then if you managed it right, you would even get extra income. And then from there, listening to you guys and other interviews, I discovered house hacking. Um, and at that point, we weren't really saving any money. So this is like middle of 2017. We weren't really saving any money and neither of us made a whole lot in our careers. Um, and so that seemed like an obvious choice for us in terms of, you know, buying a property, moving into it and reducing our cost of living. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. What about you, Ali? What, what did he have to convince you? Were you like, let's run with this? Uh, were you fully on board? Give us, give us the nuts and bolts. It was definitely a dramatic adventure throughout the process. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. like first it's like, Hey, there's this guy named Dave, named Dave Ramsey. Let's like cut out all of the fun things you want to do in life and go totally like, you know, bare bones minimum. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't really want to do this, but like, I trust <laughs> you and support you. Like maybe let's try it. And then like three minutes later, we're like, this is not sustainable. We don't want to do this, but here's bigger pockets and let's, uh, sell our cars and get used and become landlords. And I'm like, who is this guy? And is he trying to actually ruin my life? Right Did now? I pick one of the best three in the class? I could have done better. <laughs> and this was a year before we got married. So she was already oh kind of feeling gosh. me out a little bit. This, yeah. We were literally looking at houses as we were like about to walk down the aisle. So yeah. um, it was a few months before our wedding that we started our search. So eventually I was like, fine, we'll do it. I feel like I was kind of bullied into it. I did not fully agree, but I was like, let's see what happens. Um, but then when we found the house that worked for us, I love our first house hack. And eventually somewhere along the way, I did my own self-education and I truly drank the Kool-Aid, um, so to speak, and really saw the power of everything that we're doing today. So he did not have buy-in from me in the beginning at all. It was like the opposite. <laughs> um, but now I'm totally obsessed with it too, which is what matters and what's important for us. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so it's interesting because at the end of the day, you guys were trying to get started, but in the beginning, it's more from the perspective, like, am I, are, are we starting the right way? We are going from one, like the Dave Ramsey route to the, mm -hmm. you can call it the rich dad, poor dad route with yep. creating for passive income. Um, at what point, like for, for the audience, how would you recommend for people to get on board if their spouse may not be on board yet or wanting to tell them, hey, this is what I read. Does this resonate with you? Would you want to get started on board with me on that? What would you guys recommend? 
So I think a really important thing is to sit down and have money and finance conversations early and often. When we first started dating, we didn't talk about money at all. And it took a long time for us to have those conversations. And in the beginning, Josh was coming at me with the numbers and the Excel sheets and this property cash flows and the cash on cash return. And it was like another language. I didn't care. I couldn't relate to it. So we say this a lot, but eventually it got to the point where he started speaking my language. And it's like, what does Allie value? And for me, it was like time with friends, time freedom, more time with family, more traveling, all of these like ROIs on your investment that weren't just the numbers. Um, And I think once we were able to develop a solid vision of how these decisions could benefit us numbers, but also quality of life, that was the true game changer for aligning that vision and getting on board. And from there, it was like rocket fuel once we had that shared vision, you know? I like that a lot um, because everyone asks me that same question, like Felipe, because I actually house hacked when we, that first year we got married. So like people, we had people Airbnb, well, we actually Airbnb, same thing, but we Airbnb at our house while me and my wife were married. People are like, how did you convince your wife to do that? And it's the same thing like Ali just said. For me, it was about showing my wife the numbers, not telling her. I feel like a lot of time as husbands, right? I can only speak for for, for men. Um, you know, we tend to like want to tell our wives like, Hey, this is going to work. This is how you do it. And then half the time we're wrong anyways. So for me, it was more like, all right, babe, here are the numbers. This is what it can do for us. Not only now after one year is our DTI gone 80% of it on this mortgage, we can now buy another property and we no longer have to house hack. So after one year of house hacking, sacrificing, we can house hack a different house and we can stay in our house and then snowball that year after year. Um, but Ali, I wanted to jump back really quick into something you said, uh, you said, uh, uh, like speaking your language and talking money and like all these things. Why do you think, actually, I'm going to ask Josh this. And then I also want to hear on Ali, but what do you think, or, or why do you think money is so taboo in relationships, especially first starting out? Yeah. So I think a lot of it is it's taboo because we don't teach it. I think if okay, people, I like that. If people feel comfortable or confident about something, there's a good chance that they're more inclined to have a dialogue about it. If they don't have to be an expert in it, but if, if they have at least have like a baseline knowledge in it, um, at least the two of us, and I know like financial literacy is a big problem, you know, in the United States and in the world, neither one of us came from a background where money was discussed. It was very taboo. And so that was kind of what was modeled for us. And so then as adults and as newlyweds, it still wasn't something that was very popular for us. Um, We're a lot better at it today than when we first started, um, but it was very foreign when we first got married. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think if someone educated me more in the beginning on finances uh, and and all that, it, it would have been easier for me in the beginning. Like I didn't know about credit. That's the worst thing. When me and my wife got married, I, I was like, Hey babe, I don't want to have any credit cards. Cause I've always heard bad things about it. Right. Dave Ramsey. And now I'm like, Oh my gosh, what an idiot. I should have started years ago doing better with my credit. Right. Yeah, I think I totally agree with what both of you are saying. And I think like the threads of our society, like we don't promote financial literacy in that way. We promote um, other things that we can talk about in relationships. We promote spending. We promote like intimacy. And you see that in movies, TV, all of that stuff. So those are things you can talk about really quick. Like people will post, oh, I bought this new $60,000 car. How amazing. And like you get 500 likes on social media. But then if you said like, oh, I invested in my Roth IRA, I maxed it out this year. No one really cares and no one wants to talk about it. Right. So I think it's what we what we value and what we talk about and what we teach our kids. So that's why for us, it's just so important to like normalize those money conversations early and often, because that is what, that is what's going to give you that long-term success. Yeah, no. And, and what's interesting about that too, is that it's that having that open communication, the dialogue to see, okay, what was that background of yours? Like, what is, what is your, like the way that you would like to spend money in the future, how how do you view money and then see how both of you guys can apply it together? Um, if there's a difference, how, how, how can you guys change it, right? If you know that one can take you farther than, than the other version. 
Um, but yeah, so, but to move on uh, to your real estate journey and your portfolio and everything, uh, can you guys tell us about your first deal? Absolutely. So um, the first almost deal uh, probably would have ruined our real estate investing careers because it was it was the property where the Excel sheet said, this is a great deal, but it was in a bad location. Um, there was, you know, prayer vigil because there had just been a murder there. And I brought Allie there and she is like, I'm never investing in real estate. Um, luckily, we persevered um, and we found another property um, about a mile or two away and it ended up being a phenomenal duplex. We originally thought, you know, listening to stories of others that in order to house hack, we really had to, you know, sacrifice our quality of life, live in a room and so on and so forth, or live in a rough area. But we found a great duplex. Um, it was a five bedroom, two bath. And the downstairs, it was off market. The downstairs was um, a husband and wife who were also house hacking, but were now looking to grow their family. And so they no longer wanted to live in a duplex. Um, but they specifically were really looking to partner with for the deal um, with another couple who they could relate to. And so that was kind of our calling card. Um, the property was 155000 and uh, the upstairs was already rented for 725 a month. The total PEI-TI was 1362 And uh, okay, that's great. Uh, so that was your first opportunity. That was your, your, your first house um, on the house hacking journey. Yep. What um, did, did you guys then live in there for a year or for two years? Or are you guys still living in that house? We lived there for about a year and a half and about a year in Josh was like, okay, let's start looking for our next deal. Yeah. And I'm like, what? We just got into this one. Um, oh. But, but we started looking again off market and we actually had been regularly networking with people in the area. And um, there was another investor who had a house six houses away from our current house hack that he was looking to sell. Um, okay. So we were able to move into that property as well for the first property. Um, we used a 5% conventional loan. And for the second one, we did a 3.5% FHA. So for the second one, we just moved there this past September. So we're coming up on a year in this house hack. Um, so it's been pretty cool, though. Yeah. And so that property was, well, this property actually was $150,000. Um, and the upstairs is currently rented for nine seventy five, dollars And the total PITI is twelve forty two. dollars Okay. And so... Really quick. So then you said the first one, it was a duplex and you were able to get it with 5% conventional or was it a we house? Were. No, it's a duplex. So I, I know, um, and we spoke, we speak to people about this all the time. Lending requirements have changed a lot of because of the events that transpired in 2020. Um, but so three years ago, we actually, we closed the week of Christmas, 2018. Um, we were able to do a 5% conventional at that point. Um, the upstairs was rented for 725, but we knew that once that person moved out, um, we could re-rent their unit with some cosmetic upgrades to about nine fifty a month. Wow, cool! And so you guys were living basically in your first property uh, for about what, like four hundred bucks? After you, like three hundred, four hundred. Yep, and that's when it kind of became really. It became real for us. I remember, like, we moved in the week of Christmas, celebrated the holidays, and January first, that tenant came down and he gave us the check for seven hundred and twenty-five dollars, and I was like that's weird that this person is giving me money. Yeah. Uh, it was just so foreign to me at the time, but it was the best money I ever made. That's cool. That's awesome. So everybody always remembers their first like <laughs> passive income. Yeah. Check, and you're like, holy crap, this is real. Other this people is real. You need money. Yeah. yeah. What was the, uh, I'm interested in the mindset portion of this part. So at this point, you guys, uh, wh how, what, what has shifted from that first rental check, Josh, to now and then what are the plans going forward what would you say was the biggest mindset change and then going forward what are your plans yeah so that first check again again it kind of gave us proof of concept mm -hmm. because prior to that everything was just books and podcasts right so now we had our first opportunity to make money without necessarily working for it exactly 
Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Um, and so, so we made that income and then, but we also weren't necessarily treating like a business. We were just finding a way to live cheaper. Cause like I said before, we still had a hundred thousand dollars in student loans that we didn't want to have anymore. So while yes, we bought a house hack at the end of 2018, 2019 was really just learning how to be a landlord, learning how to build systems in a business and not just treat it like a hobby. Um, and I think all in all, we spent about $40,000 on paying off a lot of our student loans. Um, but that also, we got a new renter in there. We were able to get uh, more rental income. And so we started understanding the power of it and treating it like a business and get it more systematized. And that's as that all started happening, we got that much more excited to buy another deal, especially knowing that reasonably, if we did it one more time, instead of paying 400, we pay zero. Mm -hmm. And re really quick too, because you mentioned that earlier, you bought your first property off market and your mm -hmm. second one too. Yeah. What strategies did you use to find them off market, not on the MLS? Literally networking, networking, networking. So when we first started looking, we probably put in more than a dozen offers on yep. properties that were on the MLS and we were getting outbid. I mean, we had a very small amount of capital when we were first getting started. So it was like, we're putting down offers 5% down and we need 3% seller concessions and different contingencies. So we were not really like the sexiest of buyers when you're competing with all cash buyers who are putting in 50K over asking and everything else. So mm -hmm. we had to figure out a way to make ourselves competitive in such a hot market. So for us, that was off market deals. So really it was just networking with local agents, local investors, going on Facebook, seeing apartments for rent, um, asking them if they've ever thought about selling um, and really just telling people who we are and what we do. We're Josh and Allie, we're newlyweds, we're looking to buy our first duplex and this is what we do. We want to better our community and create safe and affordable housing. And just saying that message over and over in a non-spammy way um, and just building relationships. We always say for us, real estate, is relational and not transactional. So we are looking to build meaningful, you know, connections in our community. Yeah, I really, really quick. Um, Ali and Josh, how, I, I, so you guys are talking about like building relationships and getting yourself out there and how important was taking action on that first step? Cause Josh said something crucial a second ago. He said, after all the podcasts and all the books, it almost sounded like, oh my gosh, like finally I did something. So I want to dig into that a little bit. How important was taking action on that first property? Yeah, I think it was crucial because I think there is there is a cap on gaining knowledge and you can kind of accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. But eventually, if you don't implement that and convert it into action, um, all of a sudden, it's just kind of you start losing momentum. And for us, it really was kind of like a momentum uh, thing. And so uh, getting that first deal, it made it, again, it made it real. All of a sudden, all the information that I had been learning was now real. And now we were able to implement it. And it's kind of like reading about riding a bike versus riding a bike. Mm -hmm. I think too, like it got to the point where like, this is Josh in particular, but like he was consuming so much content, reading so many books, listening to so many podcasts. It got to the point where it was like, counterintuitive and it became a point of stress or anxiety because it's like I'm hearing all these people doing this stuff and I'm not doing it yet and it was causing that like discontentment so I think it was important to take that action because what if I just listen to one more podcast or read one more book? Guess what? You're still going to make mistakes like the rest of us so it's important to just like make those action steps towards your goals for sure. Josh it sounds like she was going to kick you out if you read one more podcast dude. That's all I'm hearing. All I'm hearing is I was about to throw him out the window if he told me one more podcast he heard. Guys. I'm glad you read between the lines because we actually <laughs> had to like set up boundaries. I'm like, you are I'm limited you. to three podcasts a day, like three podcasts get it. a day. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I yeah. was like, I was like, this is Felipe. This is Diego. I was sending her Excel sheets. I was doing so much because I was like, it, it was the one thing I could control. I couldn't, I didn't, we didn't have a deal yet. So I wanted to do the one thing that I felt would bring me closer. And if I wasn't talking to a person in person about real estate or networking, I was studying real estate. I'm sorry, Ali. It sounds like he just dumped a bunch of information on you. And you were like, oh my gosh, if you say one more thing, I swear. 
Right. But <laughs> that's hilarious. So r- really quick, Josh, uh, what would you say? And then we'll move on. But what would you say to someone who's scared to jump in, who's scared to take action on that first property? Because I think we all had fear to do that. Right. But what was it for you guys where it was like, OK, enough with the book, enough with the wisdom, enough with the masterminds that the uh, enough. I need to just take action. What would you say to somebody that's at that place? Yeah, I would say a find a mentor, whether it's in person or digital. Um, And we surrounded ourselves with people who um, had already done it. And so that kind of gave us more confidence. Uh, People who were kind of right at the edge of that cliff. And they're like, no, no, it's okay. Like, this is going to be good. Um, Learning how to run numbers. That was really, really helpful. Just the act of saying like, there's a person living there and they pay this. And this is the total mortgage. And that minus that is a fraction of what we're currently paying. The numbers really helped, especially when I was communicating with Allie. And then I would say probably like the biggest thing is we were having money conversations, but originally it was called almost like the end goal was money. And where I had to learn how to reframe was seeing money and investments like real estate, not as the end goal, but as the bridge, a bridge to the things that we like to do the most of. And once I started having those conversations with Allie, she was all on board because she understood that the real estate was just a bridge to more time freedom to be with family, to travel, et cetera. I think also like the mindset behind it is so huge. So it was so scary to take that risk because what if I fail? What if something goes wrong? What if something breaks? All of that. But to shift it for a new investor, like for us too, it was like, what if I don't do anything? If I don't do anything, I'm living a life that I don't necessarily want to live. We have $100,000 in debt and we have no real systems to pay it off. So it is leave. It is either like a life of complacency where I am, or it is taking a big risk to get an awesome payoff. So for us, it was like, we don't want to live this life that we're living right now. So we, we have no other choice than to make this change. So that was big for us. Yeah. And in that process too, because you mentioned that you guys also submitted like 12 offers, right? (laughs) That can sometimes stop a lot of people where you can say, well, I'm jumping in, I'm doing it, but I'm getting beat out. Um, I like that you guys went above and beyond and we're like, you know what, even though we might, we might get stuck, like not being able to get our offer accepted on the MLS, let's go, let's do a little bit of extra work and find houses off market. Uh, I feel like that's a lot, like that's another obstacle that a lot of people will say, well, I'm not investing in real estate because I can't find good deals. Uh, Well, you have to make your way to be able to find a good deal. And I feel like you guys really did it. So yeah, really really happy that you guys did it for your first one and your second one. Yeah. It was like the no why principle, like Felipe talks about. I mean, we were getting our butts kicked on every single offer. And I remember like we were literally in the grocery store one night. We were like, this is, I literally got there as the agent was staking in the sign. I was like, boom, I got this. No one's going to beat me on this. It was 12 offers. Three were all cash. I think it was like 20 offers. Either way. uh, And we were in, um, we were in a grocery store. And at that moment, our agent said, Hey, competitive offer guys just didn't happen. And I remember like, we were like crying in the grocery store. We're like, this is just not going to happen for us. Like, this is however many offers, like, we're just going to keep getting beat out. But it was kind of like, all right, well, why? Like, why are we continuously getting beaten out? And so we started adapting where we were looking, what our terms were on our deal, any concessions, things like that, and just kept on moving forward. Yeah. What is, what is the no why? And then I got a follow-up question, but what is the no why that Felipe talks about? Yeah, no, I mean, that was honestly such a cool principle, just listening to your story. So the no why, as I took it, was people are going to tell you no in terms of things that you're looking to pursue. And that's totally fine to me. Like that's just like a door, but you always follow up with why, because then it's a learning opportunity so that the next time you're pursuing that thing, whether it's a job, whether it's a real estate investment, whether it's a girl, whatever it is, understand why they're saying no so that you can adapt, modify, push forward and get a yes the next time. I agree with that a hundred percent. Uh, no, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's very simply that it's like, I got tired of growing up with nose and my mom like taught me, you know, I'm, I'm Latino. It's kind of obvious. Um, my mom always grew up like, it's going to be a little bit harder for us, especially in the South. Like it's, but it's okay. But what's not okay is to not have a reason. It's like, 
someone can tell you no, Felipe, and that's fine. And if it's something that you can fix, the ball is always back in your court. No, I'm not going to date you because you're not above six foot. That's not something I can fix, right? No, I'm not going to give you this loan because you need to make 94000 a year, not eighty. Okay, that's something that I can go back and fix, and I will be back tomorrow better, bigger, and stronger, right? So that no why concept is like not – Diego is going to correct me on this. It's something about like not having the – the what's the mentality Diego that we talk about sometimes where I don't want to have the go ahead yeah you don't want to have the victim mentality but have the go empowered for mentality yes and that's so why saying why right. yeah having that why gives you empowerment right saying no and taking out walking away with that no gives you that victim mentality but asking why now empowers you to say, okay, now I know why that person said no I'm gonna go fix that and every time I talk about the no why concept, um, I remember the deal where I learned that from, which was a rental property that's one of my highest cash flowing properties. This is no joke. It does about $1,800 a month in cash flow. And I have debt on it, full debt. It's like fully funded by the bank, but like 18% or something. And the bank told me no every single month when I brought this deal. And finally, they ran out of no's to give me. Like they were like, no, your credit scores are high enough. No, you don't have enough money. No, you don't this. No, you don't that. By the end of it, the bank kept the loan in-house. And she was like, oh my gosh, Felipe, I'm going to give you the loan. You have five years to pay it off. Go figure it out. Get out of my office. And I got the deal. <laughs> Three years later, I refinanced it into a, into a 30-year mortgage, took out all my money, and then some, and I still cash flow a bunch of money. So it's that empowerment mentality that comes from, no, but why? Why not? And, and sometimes in life, you have to be that squeaky wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. I'm going to get off that horse now and we're gonna no, get I back to it. Ali and Josh <laughs> sorry we're gonna go back okay so I actually want it Diego shut up I know he's gonna tear he's gonna tear me a new one after this I want it <laughs> do you look you guys see Diego this is my business partner I swear to god okay uh I want to dig in really quick into your student loans part I don't care about the amount but what I do care about is earlier you said that you're going to use real estate to help you through student loans there is hundreds of thousands of people out there with student loans why did you get into more debt with student loan debt Dave Ramsey says you shouldn't go do anything. Please talk about this and educate the audience on how important this part is. Absolutely. So, you know, Josh and I, as we said, we're both in human service careers. We're not making Silicon Valley salaries. So it's kind of like when you look at your expenses and you look at your incomes before we got into real estate, the margin between that was so skinny. We were spending pretty much just as much as we were making, if not more, if not more, we were in debt. Right. So for us, it was like, we need to find a way to either reduce our expenses or increase our incomes or or ideally both. So through house hacking, we were eventually able to bring our housing costs down to zero. So we went from spending thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a month on housing to zero. And then subsequently, we also got rid of our car notes. So now instead of making car payments, we freed that up too. So systematically, we were able to increase our incomes and reduce our expenses. And then all of the gap we're investing it. We're investing it into real estate. We're investing it into paying off our debt. And if we hadn't went into more debt by buying the property, we wouldn't have been able to increase that gap as dramatically. And I think the big thing for us too, was understanding that not all debt is created equal. Right. Um, some Ooh, debt, I like that. I like that. Some yeah. debt actually gives you a lot more money than it costs you uh, and is paid for by others. And then some debt costs you a lot more than it gives you, and you have to pay for renting out your time. As we started delineating between good debt, bad debt, and just kind of stepping away from like all debt is evil, um, then we started to really understand, wow, like there is a really cool way to leverage debt, conservative debt, fixed rate 30 year debt. Um, that will enhance our ability to achieve our goals. And so that's really when we started leaning more into how can we accumulate as much debt, good debt, <laughs> as reasonably possible. And I think it's figuring out like what you value and what makes sense for you. We started this journey 
pretty much the beginning of 2019. And in that time, we went from $102,000 in student loans to now $40,000. So in two years time, we've paid off over 60,000 in student loans. And it's not like an accident or luck. It is like commitment wow. and continued discipline. And it is truly because of real estate and continuing to educate ourselves on personal finance and making it a priority to not only pay off the loans, but to invest in other asset classes. So here's a question. And then we're going to uh, jump into what's next and then your IG. Uh, I'll let Diego jump into what's what's next for you guys. But I got a quick question. So I got a friend who's in real estate, super in debt up to his eyeballs, but he refuses to. So he looks at he looks very analytical into like time versus money versus work time versus like all this stuff. And he refuses to spend any worked hours that equal money, that money into not cash flowing debt. So he literally, this is so crazy. He has literally bought three duplexes to pay off student loans. The moment those duplexes have enough equity to cover the whole amount of the debt, he's going to sell off the properties, pay off the student debt and crush it. But I ask him, like, do you put any of your W-2 money towards? He's like, no, I refuse to do that. All of my W-2 money goes into buying me passive income money. My passive income money goes into my non-producing assets. I think about my student loan debts as a Ferrari. One day I want my cash flow properties to buy me a Ferrari. For now, they're paying off this student loan, right? So I'm like, okay, that's a very interesting concept. Is that something what like you guys do or are you using your worked income towards your loan? I think our mindset on debt payoff has certainly evolved over the past two years. But I think, um, you know, you have that school of thought of just get rid of the debt immediately. And then you have other people like your friend who are like, the math says you should. Yeah, not. they're like, he's like yeah. super nerdy. I right. don't even follow it. But I, I got where he was coming from. But I get it. But I think for debt, especially a large amount of debt, it takes such an emotional toll on you, like the anxiety and weight of having a hundred grand in debt, it felt like a barrier between us and our goals. It felt like we want to do this, but we have debt. We want to work part time, but we have this debt. So for us, it was like aggressive payoff, um, more so because of the emotional component versus the math. But now at this point, um, I think we're kind of shifting and we're like, we're at 40K. That feels like a more reasonable number than 100K. So now we're kind of like going to slow play our loans a little bit and then maybe shift more heavy into the investing. And what's kind of cool too is, so when we first got that 5% loan, our lender was very transparent with us that, yeah, they would lend to us, but we have $100,000 of student loans too. And so we also knew that if we wanted to, you know, because of debt to income, if we wanted to accumulate more real estate and subsequent mortgage debt, we would have to pay off our debt because lenders look at debt differently. So it was also been very calculated. We wanted to deleverage our student loans so that we could take on more mortgage debt. And, you know, when we started talking to our lender for our second property, they were doing their calculations and they were kind of looking at the numbers and they're like, you know, you guys are kind of teetering on that level of where I'm pretty sure we can get this loan done. But if you had less student loans, we could definitely get this done. So we literally just shifted. We crushed a bunch of student loans so that we penciled out better as from a DTI perspective, which then got us that property and is now paying uh, our ability to live for free. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that, sorry, is originally paying off student loans was a hundred percent active income. We pretty much have a set amount um, that we put towards student loans every single month to eliminate them. Originally it was a hundred percent active income paying for that. But now because we have a second property, that first property cash flows on a good month, probably about 450, $500 a month. As long as our reserves are kept and as long as the property is stabilized, that's 450 that can now be added to our active income. And so now it's not 100% active income, maybe it's 70% active income, 30% passive income. And as we accumulate more rental deals, less proportion of our active income will be going towards that. And then eventually, and we'll probably have maybe like 10,000 bucks at that point in a nice rental portfolio. Yeah, rental portfolio cash flow will probably just pay off the remaining 10,000. There That's you go. Awesome. I really like the way that you guys have like that plan in place because it allows you to actually uh, be on the same page, of course, uh, but understand that your cash flow will change yeah. as 
as like from your active to your passive that will be paying all of your student debt, yep. which is really important as a way to see it. Um, now, what's going to be next for you guys, let's say in 2022, 2023 mm-hmm. with your real estate portfolio? <laughs> Man, this this is like a big topic of conversation right now. Like every like, day. <laughs> usually like the first half of the year, we're pretty much like stabilize whatever deal we just bought, pay off a bunch of student loans and then build up our cash, you know, and then like enjoy summer. But then as summer kind of progresses, we're like, we kind of get that itch. So we know house hacking. We know we can house hack. We can refinance the property in right now, get another FHA. Um, that's totally cool. So that's not completely off the table. But admittedly, um, we're a little burnt out on house hacking. Um, so we're having that conversation now. Of like, well, if we you're wanted- growing, <laughs> yay. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's like safe and easy to say, let's do a third house hack. Yep. Let's do a fourth house hack. We know that system. We know how to do it. Yep. But, you know, um, I would like to not move every year and have like a more <laughs> stable situation and, you know, our first house hack was lovely. It was big, spacious, private backyard. This second one, I feel like a college kid in like a, you know, crappy college apartment. So I'm like, I'm like a grown up. I, I, I need a, I don't need a mansion, but I need a little more than what we're working with. So I think that is a reality. And it's saying, you know, let's get a little uncomfortable. Let's use not just our money. Let's get into private money. Let's figure out different deals and more creative financing And then maybe our next deal is a single family home that is modest and our properties can pay for most of it. But so we don't have to move all the time because for me, I think a big lesson from this second house hack is like, if your home base and your quality of life isn't, you know, where you want it to be, that impacts your ability to then make like informed decisions and want to move forward. So I think that has been like a big mindset shift for us. Ali, Josh, you guys don't have any kids, right? We don't, but we want Planet. kids. And I'm like, if I have a baby in this yeah. apartment, <laughs> so that's another motivator. <laughs> yep. So my son was conceived after we got our own house. So be careful. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, just, I'm not saying it. I'm, ready I'm for not. It. I'm just, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I love it. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, that's a, oh. I, no, I was just going to say, yeah, I think that would be really cool of you guys uh, to get your own place. It, It kind of gives you that freedom to think of like, okay, what's bigger and better next? What's available going forward? And like Ali said, uh, financially, how can I get more creative? How can I partner with other people to do bigger and better deals, right? Like, how does this work to get out of my comfort zone of house hacking? You guys are comfortable house hacking. When you get comfortable, it's almost, that, that should be a surefire sign that it's time to move on. We are comfortable house hacking. Let's get into bigger multifamily. We're comfortable multifamily. Diego and I are now like partnering with other people to do 16, 20, you know, bigger deals. Um, we just signed on another, or we just signed an LOI for a bigger deal, right? It's the biggest we've ever done. It's like, you're comfortable now, get to the next one. I did nine house hacks, guys, nine. <laughs> so like I have nine single family homes that are like, so I, I literally have one more mortgage that I can do. And my wife said, no more we are going to get our house. So Josh, don't wait. Okay. I'm telling you now, don't wait. Um, Diego, are you cool? Or go ahead, Josh. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, I love it. And um, nine yeah. house hacks. I can't, you know, and our, and our big that thing is, like is too, right? So big picture, we never really envisioned ourselves having like a huge portfolio. If we had enough of a, if we had enough units so that in a nice single family home, our properties pay for that. If Ali, right now she drives a very used, beat up to Toyota uh, Corolla. If one day she wanted to have a slightly nicer car, paid in cash, um, our rental properties would pay for that as well. And so that's kind of always been our vision. And especially after the events that took place last year, we spent a lot more time in a tiny little apartment. Um, and so I think, yeah, we're definitely excited to, yes, yeah, still get that single family, but also kind of the same way we had to level up our mindset and level up our network three years ago just to get into real estate. This is kind of that next phase, like phase two, if you will, of you know finding private money partners. We do a ton of off-market networking already. We have a very filled up um, off-market deal flow right now. So really our, our, our biggest problem right now is just finding private money um, and sufficient private money 
um, because we have the deal flow there. So um, I think that's kind of the next uh, next iteration of our investing. Got it. No, that makes that makes sense. Ask about the uh, IG. Yeah. Yes. So I want to know. I want to know about your growth on IG. It sounds like it's very organic. It sounds like you guys are out there crushing it. What do you got? So, yeah, so we launched the Phi Couple um, via social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook um, in November of 2020. So we're, you know, probably about seven, eight months ago. And it was just kind of like a fun project. We had a lot of time on our hands and we thought, hey, if we can share our story and maybe one person will get value from it, um, that will be that's worth it. Um, we have taken off and a lot of people have uh, really related with our story. I think right now between Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, we're somewhere in the ballpark of about 40,000 uh, total followers. Um, so it's been, it's been really cool. Um, and it's also a lot of work. <laughs> always is, always is. So what, uh, I, I guess my last question, and if Diego has one last one, I'm going to ask. What are you planning to do with your social media? Yeah, for sure. I think um, we're pretty excited about like connecting with so many people on social media. In the beginning, we were like, we just want to network with people that are doing what we're doing for like accountability, knowledge, education, all of that. Um, but through the Phi Couple, we have really been able to um, connect with so many like-minded people. And we offer mentoring to beginners in investing in real estate. And um, that has been incredible to connect with people all across the country. Um, Back in May, actually, Mother's Day weekend in May, we decided to launch our first ever ebook, which was um, really hard. And I gave a whole lot more credit to people who write like full length paperback books. Mm. Like that is so much work. Um, so we wrote an ebook because we wanted to be able to teach people uh, how to house hack. And so um, that's been a great resource. We love the feedback we're getting um, from people there. Um, and then, like Ali said, we do coach, we coach people with. Uh, different backgrounds, whether it's just general finance, if they're looking to get started in real estate. And I think our big calling card is we're, we're not rookies anymore, but we're still not there. You know what I mean? We are not Diego. We're not Felipe. We have a long ways to go. We're, but we're a few steps ahead. And I think a lot of the people who have uh, connected with us have said, you know, it's really nice to work with someone who's only a few steps ahead of me because it shows me like, if you guys can do it, we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a big part that we're um, doing through social media now. The last thing I'll say with that, and I'll pass it on to Diego, is earlier you said that you the next thing for you is going to be like trying to find funding for certain deals. Use social media to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah, we're Diego, what's up? No, I was just going to say it's been really cool to see the growth that you guys have, have been doing. And Agreed. just what you guys said about you guys don't really need to be like all this like grandiose have hundreds of properties or anything just be like hey i am just a few steps ahead of you yep. but we are taking action and we can show you how we did it exactly. and i feel like that's one of the reasons too why we created rad race to fi with with like the two of us here it was because we had a lot of people that reached out and they were like hey we're stuck uh, sometimes it's hard to talk to people that have, again, hundreds of properties, but you guys are really relatable and I feel relatable, which is what you guys are too. I feel like that allows you to even help a lot more people. Yeah. So I'm excited to see where all your IG growth is going to go. What, what, uh, what your ebook is going to do. So we'll definitely add all of those links in the, in the show notes so that other people can check it out. Perfect. No, we appreciate that. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Absolutely. Ali, Josh, is there anything that you wish we would have asked you? Oh, man. Um, that's Last a, question. That is a oh, big that's one. like a challenging question. Uh, <laughs> is there anything you want to say? No, I mean, you know, we said it off air and I'll say it again here. I mean, the two of you have been a huge inspiration for me. Um, you know, I, we're not here today. We're not real estate investors. If I don't listen to Diego's story about DACA, your story, uh, Felipe, in terms of like the no way concept. And so, um, it's just a huge honor to be, I mean, I've been learning from you guys from years. Um, so it's just really cool to be talking to you today. Yeah. If anything, the Phi couple is like a selfish way that we can like actually connect with the people that like have been yeah. role models to us and inspiration. So it's just so incredible to have that like full circle moment. So really awesome. 
Yeah. That's that's really, awesome. Really exciting. <laughs> Quick question, last one. And um, since you guys are in like the social media and all that stuff, are you guys uh, gonna be in Austin in September for FinCon? We are. So we plan to. <laughs> We're really excited. Awesome. We really want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, actually. So I think um, I was talking to Andreas about that. And so uh, we're we're coordinating everything right now. Um, but yeah, as it stands right now, we will be in Austin in September. Perfect. So nice. for the audience here, Philippe and I are going to be here in September. The five couple is going to be here in September. There's going to be a lot of really cool people. So for anybody that is wanting to come to FinCon, definitely hit us up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Ali, Josh, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the Rat Race to Five podcast. Honestly, thank you for being on. Your story is inspirational. Uh, your social media growth is a testament, I think, to your real estate growth coming soon. So I'm super excited to continue to follow, uh, to interact. Uh, really quick, Ali, Josh, where can people connect with you? Obviously, the Phi Couple, absolutely. So you can find us on most major social media platforms, right? So um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I think that is it for now. We have a website, The Phi Couple. So absolutely connect with us, shoot us a message. We'd love to meet you. Yeah, we love connecting <laughs> with new people. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. The Rap Race to Phi Podcast where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place.